Uh, I'm Philip Lewis. Uh, I'm a professor at Stanford Computer Science Electrical Engineering, uh, and I've taught some people in this audience who were going to introduce me, but then they realized they completely forgot the class that I taught. They just excised it from their memory because it was so terrible, um, and so that should maybe hopefully set a low bar uh, for this talk. Um, so uh, I was asked to come talk about virtual worlds, um, and this is an interesting topic to me because about at this point, almost a decade ago, uh, a group of us at Stanford did about a five-year project on how would you build large-scale distributed world platforms, a platform to be able to build applications for virtual worlds. Um, and the, the major question we asked was, if virtual worlds became like the next dominant platform, so think like post-web, now we're like logging into these virtual worlds, how would you actually design software systems in the network to support that? Um, it turns out that modern approaches, there's all kinds of issues, and I'll, I'll walk through this in the talk. Um, and so we researched, built, developed, deployed um, a virtual world system using a bunch of um, sociology uh, research. Uh, could run on about 20 servers. Yeah, it's just recording. There's a big red button. Um, we're on about 20 servers. Um, and we actually had to invent a whole bunch of technologies to make this happen. Um, and I think, and I'll sort of get it at the end, but one of the things, if you, log, if you use any kind of virtual world-ish thing today, whether at the time, even Second Life was big, um, but uh, like World of Warcraft, you realize there are all of these weird technological limitations in those systems that you sort of take for granted. Um, I'll give you a simple example. I remember uh, this was like when Star Wars, was it Age of the Republic, there was the MMO, Star Wars MMO came out. And you'd be wandering around in a town, and every town you'd walk in, every town you're in, you're then there's like a big room that's a cantina, that's the cantina room, uh, the building. And you go to it, and there's a door. There's a really big door, so lots of people can come in and out. And right in front of the door, there's a wall. And so to go into the cantina, you kind of have to like walk in and then walk around this wall. And this was omnipresent anywhere you went, any big place people might go, there's a wall in front of the door. And the reason is that they couldn't quite handle, figure out how to do like visibility within that room or within that building from outside. Like the number of objects you have to handle. So what they do is they just make it that there's no line of sight uh, within this large space. They can partition it more easily. Um, so you get all these weird visual artifacts or like, you know, sort of content artifacts based on some underlying systems problems. Um, and so, yeah, that's why back 2008, you got stuff like uh, Second Life, um, where this was this PlayStation Home thing, which died out. There were lots of virtual worlds that failed. You had stuff like World of Warcraft, you know, it was still uh, very, very big at the time, where you got tens of millions of people playing these virtual worlds, lots of fun, immersive environments. You know, did anyone see those videos about Asheron's Call when it went down? Does anyone know what Asheron's Call is? So Asheron's Call is one of the first MMOs. Uh, it was like around the time of EverQuest. Um, actually built by some people I went to college with. Um, that actually was technically very advanced, could do all kinds of crazy load balancing, and they shut down the servers for real, I think it was about a month or two ago. People have been playing this for nearly 20 years. And there's all these videos of like, as everyone's like starts to die, like disappear, as the server shuts down, and like people crying about like the community, and they imagine they would show this to their kids. when they were. And so when you look inside one of these systems is like, um, and you've got some client that's controlled by uh, the provider, you know, whoever sells you this game or this system. Um, and for the most part, uh, you know, they've got some side servers for things like chat or email within the system. Um, and then there's just some kind of cluster of servers that are running the world, where you sort of think doing the hard part of the interesting part of this application. And if you dig inside there, it's actually, it was, at least to me, when we started to do this, start scratching this, it was a little terrifying um, as to what was being done. Now, to be fair, Things like Second Life, its architecture was set out in the late 90s, right? And distributed systems have come a long way since then, and they were basically stuck with this approach. Um, and we've talked to them a couple of times, we pointed out there are lots of ways they would have loved to do things better, but you know, just the actually transitioning to some new system was not within their financial or time frame possibilities. So this is basically how Second Life worked. Um, the whole world was uh, divided into tiles called Sims, um, and Sims had a static limit as to how many people could be on one. So, for example, normally it was 40. If you were like really awesome, um, then you could do something where like you would, what people would do is they want an event with more than 40 people. What they do is they'd get four Sims that were all met on a corner and then they hold the event right in the middle and then they could get about 140 people. Not 160 because there's some communication across the Sims. So basically, statically partitioned, Sims are bound to servers, um, Sims don't migrate. 
and you can get about 40 people in a zone. Uh, World of Warcraft, um, and basically this is the direction that games went uh, post, um, you know, Asheron's Call or Shadowbane or something like that. Um, essentially, there is a server for each continent in this fantastical and awesome uh, uh, game world, and there are login queues to get into the continents, etc. But then the predominant, all the content of the system, like the dungeons and stuff you go to, are in instances. So basically, little, you know, think fragments of the world that nobody can interact with. There's this private little space, and they can just scale those up or scale those down. There can be multiple instances of the same thing. But essentially, it's either everybody's in this continent, and then there's all kinds of bandwidth limitations, all kinds of performance limitations. So there's login queues, or they actually just parcel out into the share nothing uh, little instances across the world. Um, this is very different than stuff, for example, even some early systems did, where you had like a single cohesive world with no boundaries between. You could just run from one side of the world to the other, and it's dynamically load balancing what's on servers. Um, but people moved away from that to these really static partitionings, which had issues of logins and load balancing, et cetera. But also, this approach, in some ways, at least was in our opinion, really went against kind of the whole point. The whole point of these virtual worlds, these environments, was to interact with people. But the idea that you're, cement, you're sort of putting everyone in their own little bin meant that, sure, you've got your friends, those are the people you play with, but it's no longer actually that sort of, uh, say, interactive or densely interacting socialist space. Plus, I mean, it's the 21st century. We thought you should scale this stuff past a single server. Um, rather than having these systems that are just controlled, say, by, um, uh, by Blizzard um, or by Linden Labs, where they run the servers, you can load code on the servers if it was Second Life, but it's very limited. Um, anybody should be able to extend one of these street systems, one of these virtual worlds. I should be able to like, bring up my own server and extend the world in some way. Like, it can run objects on it, it can do whatever you want. Um, and then also this idea of creation, right? Focusing on interaction uh, rather than consumption. So think Minecraft, right? But an enormous, uh, continuous virtual world where there are tens of millions of people in the world at once. And so how do you build it? That's what we tried to figure out. First step, you, know, you break it apart. So like any computer system, it's just a large distributed computer. You've got three things you need to do. You need to communicate, you need to compute, and you need to, you know, read and write data. So communication, computation, and storage. But it's a distributed system. So in the architecture, we call the system uh, Siricata for a variety of historical reasons. First, you have computation. This is like the scripts, the actual behavior and the activity in the world. So think I've got some cool submarine or I've got a volcano or anything where you have some kind of code or some kind of logic or some kind of behavior. And these run on kind of server we called object hosts. So these are servers that are running you know, virtual machines or other protected environments. And you write some script for some object and it runs on an object host. You can run your own object host. In fact, your avatars often, any things you might do for your own local communication or local data management would be running, say, on your laptop and a little object host that connects to the world. Now, objects need to communicate. Like, I need to interact with that tree. You know, I need to turn on this light. Um, I need to make the volcano explode. Um, and so the way that communication between objects running on objects has mediated is through what you really think of as the world, the space servers. These are the servers that describe what are the objects that are in the world, where their positions, they do things like physics, um, and they also mediate all communication. I'll sort of walk through later why they have to, because there are all kinds of constraints you need to make sure the system doesn't just collapse and fall apart. Uh, finally, for storage, uh, there's a content distribution network. Um, which ends up having to do a lot of things relating to graphical data. Graphical data is different than, um, you know, sort of traditional documents for a variety of reasons, levels of detail, aggregation. Again, I'll go into some of the, the details of how this works. Any questions? Feel free to interrupt me. Anytime. So this, to me, this is like, this is some totally kooky research we did at this point almost five years ago. Um, and so, you know, I thought it was lots of fun. Um, but so if there's anything that's unclear, I'm in this weird space where we did this for five years and we make assumptions which you might not, not uh, might not agree with uh, or might not be sort of well explained. Uh, so to try to draw a picture as to what that looks like, uh, so you have here like some object hosts and you can have many object hosts talking to all kinds of different servers, right? They're all running different objects for whatever, for a particular person, a particular provider. Um, and then there are the space servers that actually manage the world. Um, and so the world, in some ways, geometrically partitioned with different space servers being responsible for different parts. I'll talk a bit about how you, how you do that um, based on load, et cetera. 
uh, you know, you can have a single object host that connects to multiple space servers or connects to even multiple different worlds if you want to. That's totally fine. I could be present in world A and world B. Um, or we have things which are on one side of the world and things that are on the other side of the world. This turns out to be really this last point that you can have a single object host or even a single object that talks to different parts of the world. It turns out to be really important for when you start scripting these things. I'll get a little bit of uh, that at the end. So if you break open, I'm going to spend most of the day talking about the space server because it's where a lot of the, the systems -y things came from. Like an object host is running scripts and it's sending messages. There isn't necessarily big scalability or distributed issues there. Um, the space server, though, has to be distributed and has to scale. So if you break it up and look what's inside, there were five major components. Um, the first is what was called, we had our little you know, acronyms from, so there's locations. This is, this is physics. This is basically a table of saying all the objects that are here on me that I'm responsible for, what's their position, I run physics, see if they collide. You know, this sort of the definitive, the authoritative statement is the physical location of an object in the world. Uh, so that's loc. Um, then there's a service called coordinate segmentation, CSEG. This is basically a service where you say, I have a bounding box in the world, some geometric region I care about. What servers are responsible for it? If I want to send a message to an object to that position in the world, or I want to ask something about that world, which server should I talk to? Uh, simplest thing is when you log in and you have a position you want to start in your home, you need to ask the system, what server is currently handling my home? The space server is responsible for it. And you ask CSEG. Um, now, if you think we're trying to do a planetary scale virtual world, think you've got six billion avatars, say, spread over something that has the surface area of the Earth. This coordinate segmentation service is actually pretty big. It's not just a server, right? Because of as things are moving and the load is being balanced and things are changing, uh, this actually is a, a distributed system in order to even answer that query. Um, the third component is something called Pinto for potentially interesting objects. This is the way that an object, if it wants to say, ask a question of what other objects are in the world, what do I see over there? This is the service that does those lookups. You basically ask a query of what do I see or some other geometric query, and it tells you what objects answered that query. Um, the, the fourth part is something called object segmentation. So coordinate segmentation tells you what server is responsible for a geometric region. And Pinto can tell you where objects, what objects you know, match a query. And then Loc can tell you where those objects are. Object segmentation is basically a cache such that if I want to send a message to an object, which space server do I send it to? What's the authoritative space server for that object? So if I want to send a message, you know, an email to my friend who's across the world in the virtual world, then I need to sort of figure out what space server is responsible for them to deliver the message. Um, and that's what object, object segmentation does. It maps objects to servers. The last component is the forwarder. This is the thing that actually manages all the messages. So you can see the object hosts send messages. That's the OHs. They send messages in the forwarder, then dispatches it to other space servers as necessary, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to walk through some of the technical sort of meat behind at least uh, the coordinate segmentation, uh, Pinto, and the forwarder. Because um, it turns out there's some pretty interesting uh, systems problems that arose in trying to design this. Does architecture at all make sense? Well, if it doesn't, maybe I'll walk through an example. <laughs> so here's just uh, here's an example to try and show like how these pieces come together. Um, so this is an example of I just log into some virtual world and I want to interact with it. Well, the first step, uh, sort of labeled here one, is I need to find where my home is. So my object host connects, you know, to any uh, uh, space server, whatever it is, um, and then basically says, hey, space server, which space server is responsible for this geometric position where I want to be? Uh, that space server, can then space server can then respond and say, oh, then this is probably the space server I actually want to connect to. You can then connect to that one, um, and great. Now you know which space server is responsible for you, et cetera. So you log in, there's authentication and all that kind of stuff. And then the first question you want to ask is, so I'm going to show up in this world. What do I see? What's around me? Um, and that's when you ask, this is step two, a question to the space server, which is forwarded to Pinto, potentially interesting objects. And it's going to basically give you an answer based on your position, all these other properties of the world. What do you see? Um, you'll then start you know, spooling things in from the CDN, if necessary, et cetera. Um, then 
the next thing uh, I'm going to do say is one of the objects that I saw, I want to interact with it. Like I want to turn on the light in my home or I want to turn on, you know, the fountain or do something fun, whatever it is. Uh, so what I do is uh, I send a message. I've gotten the names of these objects from Pinto. I then send a message to that object. If this first object is local, this is arrow three, it goes up into the forward and the forward figures out, oh, this object is local to me. I'll just forward it down to the resulting object host. The object host will dispatch it. All good. Um, if it turns out the object isn't on the space server, like maybe you want to uh, do something that you know, hill over there or that house over there, um, like ask something about it, then it might get forwarded to um, a distant space server. If the entry is uh, cached, then it can just go through the forwarder. If the entry is not cached, like maybe you know some dragon just flew over the, the horizon and you want to do something about it, then you'll go through the object segmentation service to cache an entry as to what the mapping of object identifier to server is. So, yeah. Um, I, maybe I missed it, but how do you how do you Between the caches, oh, so the, you, you can't ensure consistency, right? Because you're right, like, it could be that I have a mapping saying the dragon is on server 43, and then the dragon has flown to server 42. So what'll happen is I'll send a message to the dragon on server 43, and 43 will say, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Um, and it will forward along, it's basically gonna re-query because it has more up-to-date data. But it'll also then send a message back to you, like a redirect saying, yeah, don't talk to me, your cache entry is invalid. So. You could have a it has to be on one like it exists otherwise it does not exist in the world right so, then so there is some there is some atomic transition that occurs right we say like oh i'm handing over the dragon from 43 to 42. those two servers will do that transition the way to think of it is that ultimately you're trying to deliver it to the object host and so if during that transition both of them could forward it to the dragon's object host that would be okay yeah. right yeah, but ultimately you don't want to be sitting there holding the bag for objects that have long left you, right? Because otherwise then from a scalability standpoint, it gets tricky because wait, there's a reason why maybe they left you because maybe there was some load balancing and some partitioning in the space. But again, it's, and the thing to realize is like, if you're talking about a virtual world, at least if you take it from a human centric rather than a machine to machine perspective, like you know, the time scale of a trend of a handover, et cetera, and the forwarding of the messages, is tiny compared to a person clicking, right? Like the degree, the rate at which people are interacting with things. And so you can, you can kind of get away with this a little bit. If we started getting, you know, scripts that are doing sort of effectively machine to machine stuff within, then it might get a little trickier. We didn't get that far. Yeah, so the other possibility is one of them. Oh yeah, yeah, crashing <laughs> servers, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a, I mean, because like, yeah, what do you do? Like, so yeah. like, oh, some of the world disappears, right? You right. have to bring up a new server, things have to reconnect, etc. Um, so usually the way that we handled crashing was either, I mean, it gets, it starts to get really tricky to the way that binary space partitioning works, because essentially, if one server crashed, it's very, very hard to distribute the load of the server that crashed onto many servers, because there's locality in them. Like, it can't be that the 5,000 objects that are on that server are now put on 500 different servers because they're next to each other. So often what you do is you kind of fall over to one of the servers that was adjacent that then takes over that region, but this has load balancing issues. The other thing is you could spin something up. Um, but yeah, crashing because of just the intense locality, right, and you can't sort of spray things and get, you know, independent failures is really, is pretty rough. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah. Redundancy? No, no redundancy. Uh, I mean, you could if you wanted to. Um, you know, there's sort of a trade-off there of like resources versus. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't do you can't do like coding style redundancy first of all, or so you can't do like some partial redundancy. You have to like just basically replication. Um, replication does get a little tricky, especially when you start talking about um, flooding point computations, et cetera. Like, we had real concerns that things would diverge especially when it comes to physics, right? So you do kind of need an authoritative copy. Um, you know, on the other hand, there's kind of this point like, wait, like if it crashes, you know, maybe the person just gets like booted to a nearby server or they get booted. This is something actually people are quite used to in virtual worlds. Uh, to go back to, again, Ashram's comment, I want to get your question, which I thought was actually technically one of the sophisticated ones. What they would do is if, they, they would be dynamically scaling the partitioning uh, until finally got to this like unit, which you can't get smaller than. 
And if, they, if there were more people on that, because it's circa like 1999, 2000, more people were on that one little tile than they could support, then uh, the evil sorcerer who ruled the land would cause a huge storm to appear and people who hit by lightning bolts would be teleported. So they'd say, don't do that, right? That's what they would do. So, oh, well, hold on a second, let me do this question then I can get back to you. Sure. Yeah. So similar, uh, who runs world time? So not just floating point precision, but timing is critical in physics. You run wall time, everybody on their own, or? Is uh, uh, well, so you mean, well, part of the, so I mean, with on a server, it's not difficult, right? Because that thing is just doing local physics. Right. Um, as for doing physics across uh, server boundaries, basically you're talking to at most, I mean, in the most extreme case, you're talking to 26 other servers, right? And you can imagine as long as you're synchronized with them, like I don't need to do physics with something that's five miles away. I need to do physics with things that are on my surface. And so you just time synchronize with those local servers. Um, again, also in this, we weren't, for a particular saying, we weren't necessarily concerned with ultra-realistic physics, right? In the sense of like, oh, you know, maybe like the ball moves a little too far to the left or the spin is wrong or something. I mean, physics engines themselves, you know, it's not like graphics has super accurate physics that actually scales um, in real time. So would uh, the dragon object host, for example, host its own notion of time and animate itself and then just say, tell the space server what its wings look like right now, or? Uh, no, the space server knows nothing about that. That's basically a statement of, this gets down to what the geometric models are, and this is all between object hosts. So things like when the dragon says, I'm breathing fire, effectively what it's doing, it's sending a message to all the other things, like I have transitioned to this different subpart of my model, because often those models have animations encoded in them, et cetera. And yeah, you could have some weird thing where like, you see the dragon breathe, you know, whatever, like half a second before I see it, not like often for the then we're talking we have to be very distant in the world because again adjacent servers have good time synchronization um the other thing is the only place that really tends to matter is sight because you think about the speed of sound right so for example like let's say the dragon bellows right and it roars the actually the propagation of sound across the virtual world is such that time synchronization is trivial right like sound is slow it's only light that's fast so you're also sort of helped by the fact that like people actually are not very good observers, right? If like the dragon breathed and then the knight raised his sword or something like that, like, you know, whether or not you like the knight has a greater implication on how you remember that than what actually happened. Yeah. You still, you still have a question? Yeah. Or, okay. Um, so I was just thinking like if the speed failure, if the failures are sufficiently there, which I suppose I suspect they are, Make it part of the sure. Yeah. I mean, it could be like some random act of God. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what they do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then except when you're like 14 hours into your mega raid to get like the helm of awesomeness, and then, then people get really upset. But anyways. Okay. Great. So oh, well, okay. Yeah. I'll just leave this up. We can just talk about this forever. How does this solve the overcrowding problem? You mean in the sense of like everybody jumps yeah, on everyone decides to go to Uh yeah, so one part of it is that I'll talk about like how you can partition the world. At some point, you're right, like there's only so many people going to be handled by a single server. Um, there's only so much you can do. Uh, even in the context of this time, like you could get a lot of people, like the server itself could actually handle, you know, order several thousand objects per core. So in that way, like the bottleneck was not the server. Often in those kinds of cases, the bottleneck is the graphics side of things, right? You have all these individual models. And I'll talk a little bit about how we dealt with that. Um, yeah, so. Uh, a little bit of the middle where the dragon is talking, mm -hmm. and it's on the boundary between servers. Mm -hmm. You probably don't want to think of mm -hmm. the neighboring server yeah. sort of moving back and forth. Your drunken dragon, your drunken dragon's going for a joyride on yeah, the server boundary. Yeah, these are the kinds of problems you have to deal with. So, so it means that you can actually have all those fairly distant things yourself. And if that's happening, all of your examples about how time synchronization works out, understanding right your fallacious assumption is spatially. Well, so well, like, let's let me, let's hear something like you'd actually be fairly far inside the cell. Right, so like, let's start with that assumption. So the, the case you're thinking of is this thing is weaving and it's actually moving very quickly because it actually enter back in, in and out of those cells very quickly. Like 
So what do you think is the hysteresis value I should use for, oh, this thing was in that cell or in this region and it's moved over to that region, but maybe I shouldn't move it just yet because I want to wait for a little bit. I'm just assuming that if you saw that one, then you would probably test it. Yep. Therefore, it's actually relatively easy to stay close to hospital. Yeah, it's going to be hosted by a server that is adjacent to you geometrically, which you already have like. Yeah, so there's a way, there's basically a way when the, in the physics system, right, where like you can communicate, like you're going to do physics with some objects that are not actually hosted on you. You need to do some kind of interaction there. Again, right, so let's talk about what's the scale of time synchronization that matters. So like my dragon is roaring or like doing its thing over there and it crashes into an airplane, right? For like those kinds of physics interactions, like probably like 20 to 40 milliseconds is fine, like human perception. Uh, versus if I wanted to do some very precise like balls clacking together in some, you know, um, uh, pool table, right? Then you need much more precise perhaps than that. But basically, actually, like when you get to the realm of human perception, suddenly time becomes very stretched out. Such that things we think from a system standpoint, like oh, I need like sub millisecond synchronization or microsecond synchronization, that's way beyond what you need, right? You're computing 24 frames a second, say, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, physical world is slow. Okay, uh, great. So let's let me just. Uh, I'm going to start unpacking these uh, some of them one by one. Uh, so CSEG, this is this question of I have a geometric bounding box. What server do I talk to? Uh, so CSEG um, was essentially is a large uh, distributed access aligned binary space partitioning tree. Right? So with even bisectors. So this is basically here. I'm showing in 2D, but it's in 3D as well. Um, where, although we, often we would handle the 3D case differently, because often you know, you're, it's not like you really want to partition all the different levels of air. Um, it would be the case, for example, in a city or something like that, the whole airspace is one uh, region versus uh, all the little subparts. Um, and the idea is that there's this large upper tree, which is the partitioning of the world. And that's something which is highly replicated, it's replicated across all of the servers. We did some uh, back of the envelope calculations, like you look at population growth and popul population migration over 25 years on, on the Earth. Um, you know, if you had 40 avatars per server, let's say we're limited to something like Second Life, uh, then you have about 29 million nodes in terms of your 29 leaf tiles in the world of different sizes. Um, if you constrain the upper two jep to be 16, um, it's like it's about 30 deep or so. So each of them, the lower trees is depth 14. What this would mean is based on the population movement and growth of the world of, the, of Earth over 20, those 25 years, the upper tree generally changed about a thousand times. Right? Now you can say like, gosh, is a virtual world going to be as static as a physical world? People should move more. We're not sure. That's part of the issue. Like we had no idea what would be a reason. How do you test whether this upper tree will work well enough? And this is the best sort of rule of thumb that we can come up with. So the idea is that this upper tree that's highly replicated across all, the, all the, the servers, and then the servers themselves determine the space partitioning for their subpart uh, of the world. And so when load is too high, they might break one tile into multiple tiles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we chose an access line BSP tree with even bisectors just because it makes uh, the whole process of maintaining that tree so much simpler, right? The edge cases, um, you know, one of the issues if you use an uneven bisector, what happens if you pick it in the wrong spot, then just some people move over a little bit. Better to just partition twice or three times. Okay, so that's that's CSEG, um, which was, you know, it's a, like, like a, basically a two-quarter project or a one-quarter project that a, the student did. Um, but I'd like to talk about next uh, Pinto, because I think this is one of the, the most interesting uh, pieces of work that came out. So remember, Pinto is the server who so you say, Essentially, I'm going to ask some kind of geometric query about the world and tell me the objects that satisfy that query. So one question I ask is like, what query do you want to ask? What can I see? What can I see? Okay. That's good. So that query itself is, I think that's the basic one that you want to ask. But it's a little tricky because you don't necessarily want to do occlusion, that kind of stuff, which is highly, highly dynamic. Um, 
So let's suppose we're living in a flat world. What can I see is also a little tricky because in theory you can see you know, infinitely far. Actually, let me flip this another way. What can I see, but how do you prioritize the results that come back? Clearly there's some objects you should return first. There's some objects maybe you should return second or last. How would you prioritize the results of that query? Again, you'd rather be able to ask the query than have things stream in and have the world come in rather than I sit there and I wait for five minutes for all million objects I could possibly see. Probably like how big your field of view the object is going to be. Good, exactly. Right. So let me first, that's that, exactly. So solid angle. So first, I want to talk about what people did before this. This is Second Life. Um, and so essentially, all systems, uh, what they do is, you know, there's a couple caveats where they do some hand-done aggregation, et cetera. They essentially have distance queries. They say, like, what are the objects that are within, say, 100 feet of you, 120 feet of you? And so here's a picture of Second Life. And you can see this results in all kinds of weird artifacts where you can see part of the house right, because those objects are within your, uh, your distance query, but then you don't see other parts, like there's this like floating roof. Um, and in fact, if you just take a couple steps forward, oh, sorry, sorry. take a couple steps forward, suddenly there's a wall. Because again, it was a pure distance query. Um, and this led to just extremely uh, bizarre behavior. So instead, um, what Pinto does is Pinto answers queries based on solid angle. And so you ask it, <laughs> you like solid angles? Right. It's the right answer. Well, um, uh, answer in but it turns out answering these queries is hard. And I'll sort of explain why. Um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to say, like, you know, here's my the direction that I'm looking. This is my position. Um, you often want to start off with a single direction and then go towards three degrees because you need to act three and six degrees. You actually need to um, uh, focus and sort of prioritize what's directly in front of you. Um, and so the question is, how do you efficiently and quickly answer a query like that? How big are, like, give me the biggest objects, or what are the objects that are big enough for me to see? Or give me the 10,000 biggest objects, say. Um, and so uh, we built a new data structure. Um, basically, it's an augmented uh, bounding volume hierarchy. So you take all the objects in the world. Um, is anyone here not familiar with bounding volume hierarchies? Okay, so bounding volume hierarchy, just look at this picture on the left. So we've got four objects, A, B, C, and D. Um, and they are placed in the world by that right side picture with the circles. And so A and B are kind of close to each other. And so what do you do? Well, then you build up a tree where there is some aggregate object, bounding volume X, which is just a circle around them that encompasses them. You say, oh, that's like the next level up on the tree. And the same with C and D, then there's this thing Y. What this allows you to do is very quickly call, because if you go down some part of the tree and you say, oh, this thing is too small for me to see, or this thing is smaller than the other things, and you know not to traverse any further. You can sort of iteratively go down the tree until you find things that are the, the right size. So the one augmentation you have to do is basically those, the A, 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 C, the little things in yellow on the left, is you have your bounding volume, but you also want to tell the query, what's the largest object? leaf that's actually in that bounding volume. So for example, it could be that, uh, as an example, let's look at this query Q that's querying the, the bounding volume for Z. Um, and it's going to ask Z, hey, like, I see you're this big bounding volume. I know what your, where your position is, et cetera. What's the biggest object inside you? And it's A. And say, OK, and let's, I'm just going to make a conservative assumption that A is closest to me. It's at the point on that bounding volume right? that's closest to me. Would that be big enough for me to care about? And if the answer is no, then you don't need to traverse C. Um, if it is big enough, then, then you might need to go ask about X. Like, oh, where is it actually? Because it might be its actual position is not big enough for you to care about. Um, and so this picture on the bottom shows you, uh, there's a scene that has 10 million objects, this uh, procedurally generated uh, city that we had. Um, and let's say you want to return 20,000 objects out of that city. If you just return the 20,000 closest objects, you get a picture that looks like the left, that's the distance metric. If you choose the 20,000 biggest objects, you get the picture that's on the right. All right. So it's visually, I mean, much, much better. Gosh, I'm in a world, I'm not in some weird disk land insanity. Um, what's funny though is this, uh, I absolutely love this picture because it also emphasizes a, another technical problem, which I'll get into in a second. Um, so what's the big visual feature that's missing 
in the picture on the right. The forest. The forest. Yeah, like literally, you know, the issue here is the trees, each of them is very, very small, but in aggregate, they form a large visual object. So you're literally losing the forest for the trees. That's why I thought that was my thing. It's just, sorry. <laughs> so we hold the forest problem. Yeah. So what, A is the biggest. Yep. All right. Uh, and it looks like me. Yeah. Except, let's assume if I turn sideways, I don't look quite as big. Yeah, we compute the bounding volume as a sphere on your largest axis, right? So, like, if you have like a line, what if the line is you're just looking? Yeah, you, it counts as the size of the line. Okay. Right? So, so, for simplification. Okay. Um, and so the way this ended up uh, ends up working is that. Uh, you have standing queries in the world, like this is the solid angle that I care about, this is my position. Um, and each viewer, basically an avatar, um, there's essentially this entire aggregate, enormous BVH for the entire world, right, where each space server is responsible for the object on it, um, but then there's a higher level sort of aggregate server for across the servers. You can ask the question of like, what if I want to see a mountain that's three servers away? Well, it's a mountain. Um, and what a query is, it's a standing query, as objects come and go as you move, um, which is a cut through this tree. And so then processing this query and updating it is essentially a process of maintaining and updating this cut through the tree. That make sense? No. No. Okay. Great. So um, I need to see the entire world, in theory. Like, I can see the entire world. Uh, to see the entire world, it's the entire world described as this bounding volume hierarchy, right? At the top, there's like one sphere that is the world, right? And then as you go down, smaller and smaller pieces. If I can see the entire world, then I have a cut through this tree, right? So the way to think of it is that, and this is what I'm sort of getting at, is that these like X, Y, and Z, if you would actually say each of those things is like, a, say, a forest, like, so let's say X was the higher level node for a thousand trees. If you actually make that like a forest object, then it might be, I can't see the individual trees because they're individually too small, but I see the forest object. And so this means that my view of the world is a cut through this bounding volume hierarchy and it's underlying geometric objects. So if anyone's worked in graphics, you realize I just did a bunch, a bunch of uh, hand waving because you don't have these aggregated objects. And so what does that mean? So I'll get to that. Okay, so it's a cut. So conceptually, it's just this cut through the state of the world, and that's what it means to, to see objects. Um, and so I won't go to this. There's also details about like how you do aggregate queries because it can be that you know that adjacent server there. Well, there are 50 people here who are looking at stuff over there. Rather than send 50 queries, me as the server will aggregate all of their queries to sort of the most general one, then just get only those results, and then filter them out to the individual queries for the objects. So you have aggregation. Um, between servers. And there's all kinds of ways where you're maintaining your hash table with cuts, or you're maintaining the cuts, yada, yada, yada. But a little short on time, so I won't, I won't go into that too much. Okay. So, again, getting back to that distance query versus uh, solid angle. So, the top, here's a, a little village that we built. Uh, the top left is if you have a distance query, the top right is the ideal scene, the original scene is like, if you are not limited. Um, if you use cuts, that is, you just do a cut through what are the biggest things that I can see, and I only can show you leaves, you'll see the bottom. What's actually really important is that if you have your cut, which you can see goes through a non-leaf node, you know, an internal node in the tree, you'd like to actually be able to represent those things. Basically, you don't want to lose the forest just because the individual trees are small. And so what you need to be able to do is to somehow take like a collection of trees that are on that hill and make them, rather than being 50 objects, make them be one object with one model. Does that make sense? Um, this turns out to be hard. Uh, so I'm going to talk now about the content distribution network uh, that we built for this. Um, and so the point here is you have these aggregate BVH elements, like the X, which is the aggregate of A and B, Y, which is the aggregate of C and D, and Z, which is the aggregate of X and Y. right? And the idea is what you want to do is say, take those two trees or those four trees, those 4,000 trees, put them into a single geometric, single graphical model, and then also simplify it. Because if you just have the same number of triangles, right, it's not going to work. Right? You just kind of catted some files together. That doesn't help. You need to actually do geometric uh, simplification. 
which on one hand is an extremely well-studied, um, very, very deep topic in graphics. On the other hand, it doesn't work in a certain stance. So, um, and so uh, one of the, the outcomes of the project was something called IAS, so Instance Aware Simplification. So a way to simplify graphical models that is aware of the fact that they're instant. And I'll explain what that means in a second. So to give you an idea, here is a city that we built. Um, this is half a million objects. It consi it's consisting of about 150 million uh, triangles. Raw data, this is 24 gigabytes, just to see this. It's actually multiple cities, like you can go through space. It's cool. Anyways. When I talk about instances, if you actually look at how these graphical models uh, work or how they're built, um, what they are is they're a tree of objects. Um, and often when you build it, build them, what you do is rather than say, like look at this, you look at this house and we see that there are four windows, rather than describe each window individually, what you do is you have one window model, a sort of submodel, and then it's referenced multiple times within the larger model with different uh, transformations, you know, rotations and placements. So you actually have, you know, one sub mesh for the window and just placed it different uh, geometric offsets. Right? And so you have one house model, and you also have like the door probably and the chimney, and then one window that's instanced. There are multiple instances of it. So the problem with instance meshes when you want to do simplification um, is that usually the first thing that you do when you need to run any instance, any simplification algorithm is you need to convert it actually to triangle. So you need to actually get the geometric model um, that you're talking about. You then start doing like collapsing vertices, et cetera. So effectively, you need to expand these four sub, these four windows uh, from being just submeshes into four separate windows because you might simplify them differently if you want, if you need to. And so um, essentially, when you do this transformation, the actual number of triangles in the model doesn't change. Right? In both cases, you have 1,100 triangles, but the storage space, its actual layout on the disk, et cetera, does change, right? From the perspective of I'm the graphics card, I need to render it, it's no different. From the perspective of I'm a CDN, I need to deliver it over a network, it's now bigger. Um, great. Um, and so we built um, a simplification pipeline that takes this and the fact that these are virtual worlds uh, into consideration. So first of all, the question of how you construct this BVH well, what you want to do is you kind of want to cluster objects that are not only close, but also preferentially look a little bit similar. Uh, so for example, you might cluster these two houses that look very similar rather than a house and a tree. Of course, at some point you'll need to cluster the trees too, but you try and actually keep sort of some visual similarity as a metric when you uh, construct your BVH. Then if two models look very, very similar, uh, there's, a there's a mechanism to deduplicate them. So often, you know, if somebody builds a forest, they only have three or four trees and they actually you know, just sprinkle down hundreds of each, great. Let's actually just deduplicate that. So we only have three or four models. And now in the aggregate, rather than 100 separate trees, we have four submeshes with 25 instances of each. The next step is you actually simplify the individual models, being aware of the fact that they're instance. And I'll show some visual examples of that. And the last thing you do is some stuff for texture aliasing. To basically, rather than have millions of tiny textures, you make one big texture and do some atlasing on it, some indexing to simplify the processing. And you can shrink that too. Uh, and so here's just one uh, simple model to show you what happens when you do this. So in the center is the original tree. There's a, uh, a model on disk with uh, 546 kilobytes. If you use standard, standard simplification algorithm, like so quadric simplification, and you reduce the number of triangles by 80%, the model actually grows by a factor of you know, approximately 30. Because what happens is, and I'll sort of do this, is that when you do the quadric simplification, it turns out all those leaves are instances of one leaf model. And quadric simplification starts simplifying each of the little leaves, so you end up with hundreds of different leaves and the model grows. In contrast, if you use instance aware simplification, it strictly gets smaller according to the number of triangles. Um, and basically, it, it doesn't expand out that leaf into hundreds of separate models. Now, of course, when you look at it this way, it doesn't actually look that different. And part of the trick of graphics often is that Still, it's hard to tell, so let me zoom in and show you. So this is what the tree looks like with quadric simplification. This is the where it gets bigger. If you look at all those leaves, they have these weird bumps on them, and I'll just sort of do a quick flip back and forth so you can see. So this is the original model, and this is what happens when you're in quadric simplification. Or you can see it's visually 
significantly different. All these trees have these weird art, all the leaves have these weird artifacts on them. So it got bigger and a lot worse. In contrast, this is what happens when you use instance aware simplification. Basically, it's aware that that leaf you know, is instanced many, many, many times. And so on one hand, simplifying it is only going to simplify that one submesh, but it'll have tremendous visual impact on the overall um, tree. So it doesn't simplify the leaves. Instead, it ends up simply uh, simplifying the trunk a lot. So you can see like the differences that do exist, a lot of them are on these branches and stuff that are in the tree. Um, and so using instance aware simplification, we took this scene, which was you know, 24 gigabytes of raw data, um, 350 million triangles. Basically using that, you could reduce it to about 1.4 gigabytes of data, which is enough for you know, a client to keep in memory, and you could run this at 30 frames per second. This enormous virtual world where you see these distant cities et cetera, and then as you get close to them, they start becoming, you know, partitioning into, oh, that whole city is a single object, so then, oh, it's this, the downtown, the uptown, and these cities, these buildings, it all starts breaking apart until eventually these close-up uh, buildings are individual objects. Yeah. So, uh, earlier you mentioned about um, uh, grouping uh, in our object. So, I'm kind of curious how yeah, yeah, so yeah, so we, we, we built on some just existing graphical techniques for this. Uh, I think we use Zernike descriptors, which are essentially a way of you're looking at things like the color palette and some like geometric properties of the object, which is just an approximation. I mean, this notion of like, is an object visually similar to another is something which the graphics community has studied uh, a good deal, and we just took some existing approaches off the table. But there is one, I mean, one criticism we got to review is like, and then there's like a parameter. Right? There's this thing we set, like, how much do you weight, like, color versus shape, right? And like, we thought if you set it to 0.8, it works pretty well, right? And they said, well, what's the, oh, no, 0.8 works pretty well. So, yeah. So, short answer is there any key descriptors? Yeah. Yes, yes, this is done offline. And so, yeah, so one thing you're going to is like, hold on, wait, 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 like we've got like dragons flying around. How do we aggregate stuff? How do you aggregate a flying dragon? You don't, right? Um, so we did some studies of the movement of objects and the behavior of things in Second Life, and I could pull up the possibility, you know, 96% of objects do not move over the space of a month. The world is static, like, you know, things here don't move that much that often. Um, and essentially, so it turns out you end up having two parallel data structures. There's a BVH for all the static objects, and there's basically a bag of moving objects that it, you don't try to construct aggregates for because it's not worth your time to try to do so. And you have a heuristic for when you transition things from the not move from the moving to the not moving because it flew around, the dragon flew, and then it landed and it sat there, turned to stone or something. Uh, the one thing that's tricky is if you have something which has not been moving, and then suddenly it moves. Like I have my ent right or whatever, like it's sitting there, it's sitting there, it's sitting there for three centuries, and then suddenly it moves, like. Uh oh, aggregates wrong. Need so there. There's absolutely like some points where just you know the system does not behave as you'd expect. You see latency and like why is there a tree there? There shouldn't be. It's moving, etc. So we didn't get that far because we didn't have ends. So, yeah. Well, so the question is whether or not you can like you could certainly pin something and say like, hey, this building is destroyable, right? And then like I don't want to aggregate it or something like that. Um, but yeah, in the sense of there, if the world is entirely dynamic, then a lot of these techniques uh, go out the window. So that's actually something we talk about, like you know, superhero things, like I can smash the building, right? What do you do? Um, and so, yeah, you can't you can't handle that. So. Well, so the, the way to think of it is that so like let's say you know so. Um, you know, uh, the dragon crashes into the Empire State Building, right, in New York or something like that, or kind of like Transamerica Pyramid. Well, that's part of an aggregate, like in some ways some really big aggregates representing all of San Francisco. And so suddenly there's this thing in the CDN, this geometric model, which probably took you several minutes to compute, right, which is now invalidated. And that needs to be sent to everybody so they can see it. Um, and you could just sort of step one level down the system, but like there's just like a large, uh, you know, very large scale 
potentially rapid change to the graphical content. And it turns out the thing that really kills you in all this, like the space servers and stuff, they are not the problem. The problem is just downloading the graphical content. Stuff like World of Warcraft um, can get away with this because of you saw preloaded on your machine. Things like Second Life could do with this by actually forcing you to very, very simple objects like your sims and prims and stuff like that. But that's actually the tricky thing is like, wait, that building broke. How do I get everybody to see that quickly? It could be, for example, if, if that was part of its original model, this notion of like, oh, here's what happens when it fractures or something like that, then it might not be that big a deal. Um, but I mean, even like graphics research on how things fracture, et cetera, it's all dynamic and they're generating thousands of tiny objects right from the breakpoints. Yeah. How do you know when to stop? Size. Right, so think, uh, you know, San Francisco, like I'm whatever, like 150 miles away, it's a yeah. little blip. Yeah. Just, okay, I get close enough such that the things now, the sub objects are big enough in terms of my solid angle query that those are now visually distinct. Okay, I'm gonna go one step down and then show you four objects, right? Or show you eight objects or 16 objects, right? Is it a, is it a comparison? Uh, the only thing is like, I have this cut through the whole tree which is um, show me the thousand or so however, whatever your, your criteria is for your client, like let's say 5,000 biggest things that I can see, right? And at some point that aggregate gets, gets bigger and bigger and bigger until its sub elements are bigger than some of the other things in your tree. And that point what you're gonna do is you're gonna pop down that one level and then some other things gonna pop up, right? So like as I get closer to the forest, then maybe like the cars behind me in, on, the, on the road become an aggregate but the trees start disaggregating. Okay, we got five more minutes. Uh, let's try to jump forward. So the last thing was this message forwarding. Um, we had a bunch of constraints. There's this whole issue of like, wait, you know, we can arbitrary message across the world. That's totally crazy. Uh, you could have just huge broadcast storms. The way systems did it before is you could basically just broadcast around you. It was totally unscalable. You had no way to do long distance communication unless you went through some side service like your mess, you know, like your you know, PM service in World of Warcraft. Um, and so we actually uh, built a model uh, of communication that used weighted fair queuing um, between all the objects. Uh, and the weight for the, your queue entry between a pair of objects was basically modeled on light. So the way to think of this is that uh, the amount that a, of data, of amount of bits or bits per second that an object in the world can send Imagine that it's you know, some object that's emitting light. It relates to its volume. Like volume in the world, real estate, is what lets you send data. Um, and similarly then, the amount which you can receive corresponding to the same. So two, you know, Godzilla and Mothra can send a lot of data to each other, even if they're not that close. Um, but at the same time, you know, two mice that are right next to each other can also send a lot of data to each other. Um, and so essentially what you need is you just need this function which decays with distance such that uh, if you, you know, compute the integral over the entire world, it will converge to uh, a finite value. Um, and this is basically a function that's very close to that bound. Um, and uh, so we did all these measurements like object pairs, et cetera, based on sort of by their weight. And so here is the, there's the falloff function you can see. And there's that dashed line as to what the ideal capacity between a pair of objects uh, would be based on this falloff function. Um, and then we measured it, you can see it's, it's pretty close. Um, and if you look, compute based on that weight, what was the actually doing the JFI of the objects? And you know, for basically until you get to the end of the curve, um, it's at about 0.98, so it's quite good. It drops down at the end of the curve because what happens is the, the fair queuing system we use, or any fair queuing system, essentially always allows you to send your first packet because you have zero, you've had zero utilization, so you always get to send a first packet. But you know, if you're only allowed to send one packet a day, under saturation because you're a mouse and they're a mouse and you're other side, other sides of the world, if you measure fairness over less than a day, it'll appear like you're getting more than your fair share. And so that's why there's that dip down because of this discretization um, in fairness. At some point you're saying packets, not bits. Uh, analytically, right, the fairness is uh, just stays at one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so let me touch on this. So fundamentally from a messaging standpoint, 
you know, the system would say, you can't do that. Like you can't just be emitting, like in some ways we don't have frequency division, right? We can be like, oh, you're sending on 800 megahertz. I don't care, right? Um, so actually there's this, there's actually another question, like how do you communicate at a high rate across the world? This, in some ways this is great. Like my mouse can talk to my mouse right there. What do you do if you want to send something to somebody that's really far across the world? So uh, I'm going to just talk very briefly about that because I only got three more minutes. Um, essentially the way you do that is everybody's television is actually an instance of the TV station's object in some way. By that I mean that like rather than, here's the simple example, we wrote a scripting language to how you do this stuff. Um, so one approach is like I'm writing a chess game and every piece is a different object and it has its own logic and it has to interact with a board object, et cetera. Instead, we took the position and said, aha, a single software object can have many presences, like physical manifestations or virtual manifestations in the world. And then it gives you basically centralized control to manipulate all these different things. So if you want to send messages to a friend halfway across the world, what you do is you give them, you know, some virtual object and you have another virtual object and they're attached to the same piece of code. And now they can just internally, by going through your object toast, communicate, right? They don't need to send messages across the world, right? They're the same namespace, they're the same object. Same way, like you want to turn on the TV. Well, there's a TV station, right? That like is responsible for putting stuff onto your TV and it's not going to send messages across the world to do that. It's going to do it internally in code. So it's going to be object toast to object toast communication. So, does that answer? Yeah, so this is like, I thought this was totally cool, this dude, this like, the idea of just like these multi, presence objects. Um, how do you script that? Like how you describe it? There are a couple of little tricks for an object oriented model, all kinds of stuff. Um, yes, yeah, so this was this uh, wacky project we did a couple of years ago. It was lots of fun. Um, to summarize some high level conclusions, basically what kind of came out of this is that these virtual world systems, um, you know, and also graphical systems are based on a 3D geometry which is really different than what we think of normally in distributed systems, things like key value stores or relations. Um, there's kinds of locality, there's kinds of principles that you can apply, things like you know, degradation over distance and integral over the world, um, all those sorts of things in order to, if you leverage physical properties, you can actually get, without a great deal of complexity, systems that can just inherently scale. Put another way, the physical world scales, and therefore, you, by making the virtual world behave more like it, you can get it to scale as well. Um, but to do that, you really we had to build some low-level systems, things like you know looking up positions in the world or routing to objects or fair queuing based on luminosity, in order to actually get the system to scale. All right, we wrote some papers. Yeah, happy to take any more questions. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, how much of this would apply if you were using like a box to break system? How much? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at some point, I think you do want to actually reduce to like a more geometric approach, but things, for example, what the aggregates would be like and um, your content distribution network would be very, very different, right? Because again, your, your object representations are very, very different. Um, yeah, I usually just think of voxels mostly as like the graphical representation. At some point, you're going to talk about the, what the geometry of that is. Because if you don't have that, then you're just kind of you're in trouble, right? Like if I can't tell you how big something is, right? Because I just think of it as a collection of things. I don't then compute the bounding volume around them, et cetera. It gets really tricky. Um, yeah, I would have to think more about that. Think more about that. That's a, that is a good question. But I think the, the first thing that would just completely change is the CDN, right? Um, I'd like to think that the messaging and lookup and stuff would still be mostly be the same, but it could be that if you have access, there might be some other twist that you do, which is much, much better. Yeah. What about aggregation across base servers? Uh, you mean so aggregating objects across? If you have a large mountain in the distance, maybe large enough to span servers, right? Like yeah, so that, that happens, absolutely. Um, and the way to think of that is that at some point, the bounding volume across those two servers the center of it's on one of them, right? But if you sort of walk back, also. Yeah, there is. Oh, my slide. Anyways, I'm sorry. Um, uh, there we go. There you go. Yeah, that. So there's this for like that super high level objects, like, oh, the mountain range, there's a centralized system that, or not center, but like there's a system sitting aside next to the space servers for like large world features, like the, the Rockies, right? Talk about having cuts through your trees to display 
uh, mm -hmm. certain numbers, right? Yep. Uh, that tells you how high level. Do you ever consider having a uh, child and a parent both I know that sounds weird. It means, it means an object exists twice. So like it would mean that, for example, that I have uh, the house and then I have the mountain with the house, right? Or it means that I have, you know, the Empire State Building and then the entire building, then I have like just the window too, right? So in some ways there's a, like, it implies you have two instances of the same graphical object in the world. Right, but if you're, well, the show of forests, Let's say you have this hierarchy, and A is the biggest tree in the forest, mm -hmm. and then all the other trees are also in this pair. Right? Mm -hmm. If you get close enough to see A, where it wouldn't be part of an aggregate, A would need to be mm -hmm. visualized. Then the other ones, then the ones get spread out too, right? So now you're talking about what's the branching factor of the BBH? Like, is it that to have to make this individual tree an individual object, I have to like also give you like five little ferns or do I have to give you 5,000 little ferns? And usually I think their branching factor was I think six or eight. And so you end up, you get a couple extra objects if you want to show that tree, right? Cool, great, thanks so much, yeah.